I have two questions for you. Okay, make them easy ones. I'm just get started here. How long have you been making your own decoys? And the second part is, how did you come up with the idea that you wanted to make your own hunting range? Oh, well, those are good questions. In fact, I have them right here. <laughs> uh, well, I joined the club back in 2004, and I uh, kind of walked by the game fair tent, and that's how I became aware of the club. So that's kind of the way a lot of you have joined through game fair. Um, like everyone here, I kind of love the outdoors. I love birds. I can watch them all day long. I love to duck hunt, uh, I kind of like decoys, I kind of like woodworking, so I think I'm in the right spot here. Um, so was the answer 2004 or 2005? No, it was back 2003. Okay. The first decoy I carved was in 2003. I, for some reason, I was, got the idea to carve a decoy. I, I had, uh, you know, been buying plastic decoys. I think it might have been after I built 240 jug decoys, you know, you hear about the guys with the, the milk jugs and you paint them black and you throw them out. That worked fantastic. Nothing's ever worked better than that. But I think, it, <laughs> but I think it's the 240, not the jug coys. But, uh, anyhow, so I was, I was past that phase and had to do something else. And uh, I had gone to uh, Virginia Beach. My wife had a seminar she went to and I just tagged along. I had nothing to do. I was thinking about carving. I looked in the yellow pages, looked up a carver, I called him up, I invited myself over to his house, <laughs> and he sat me down and showed me his stuff, and I, I walked away with a hen buffle head pattern. This is it. And of course I had to tweak it a little bit right off the bat. But, uh, so that summer I made this hen buffle head and a couple of drakes, and threw them out in the fall. And uh, I remember one evening, it was maybe an hour or two before sun, sunset. A little hen buffalo came in and just sat right down next to this baby and stayed there. Time to pick up the decoys. Picked up the decoys. She's still just staying there. She waited till picked up this last decoy and she finally swam away and then flew off. Flew off. And after that, I figured these homemade decoys. I gotta, I gotta go with that. So that was my first decoy, and I still like it a lot. Still one of my favorites. By the way, this is not going to be sort of a how-to. This is going to be more, more like a expanded show-and-tell. So, hope that's okay. Uh, so that was 2003. Uh, so that was 15 years ago. In the meantime, I've, count, I've, just, I've only carved 26 duck and coot decoys, a couple swan decoys. So if you figure that out, that's just like a couple a year on average. And I don't think I've done finished one for two, three years. So I'm kind of an imposter up here, but you know, what the heck. Uh, yeah, but now I retired. Now I retired as of three months, yep. So now I'm gonna have to I do have in addition to my twenty six Dr. Coot decoys, I have eleven unpainted ones on a shelf, so that's the next project. So that's what I'm gonna have to work on. Uh, one thing I was thinking about when I agreed to get up here and say something was that nobody would want to hear what I wanted to hear what I wanted to say, which then I got to thinking how varied everybody's interests here. I mean, some of you are into the decorative carving of decoys, some are working decoys like I am, some people like Tweety Birds. Uh, I remember somebody bought a Santa Claus once to show and tell. I think you can only get, you only get by with that once, right, Bruce? I've seen a tooth mower at uh, <laughs> <laughs> now. Well, so, <laughs> that's one of the neat things about the club is you can, you can just do what you want. Which one? Uh, so uh, I'll probably never make a decorative decoy. Uh, I'm not into fine detail at all, but I, I really like to hear how people do it. Maybe I can incorporate a few things. Uh, I'll probably never make a decoy out of cork. Uh, takes me forever to carve a decoy, but that's okay. That's just me. What kind of wood do you use then, basically? Well, they're all pretty. They're all pretty much the same. They're all working decoys. They're all white cedar. They're all uh, alkyd oil, alkyd oils paints. Uh, I use Gorilla Glue when I put them together. 
So this, they're all pretty much the same in that regard. So does that allocate, is that hold up well outdoors? Well, that's a, a good question. It's held up great. I have never repainted a decoy. So mm -hmm. like this one's been used for 15 years. So it's been in and out of the water, bounced around on the boat bottom a few times. So maybe in and out, of the, in and out maybe 75 times in its lifetime. So you've never sprayed anything on top of the oil? Never. Never. So it's held up, they've held it really well. Good. I can't complain. I do see, I don't know if it's a good way to do it, but my method is I seal them with a slightly thinned marine varnish and then the alkyd oils over that. And I don't do anything sealing the hollowed interior. I know some people seal that or add foam or something. I don't do anything there. <coughs> One thing I do do is I really, for a couple of years I was a cabinet maker, so I'm kind of obsessed with really good joints. So uh, you're not going to find any gaps between my bottom board and my top board or the neck or anything like that. And I, I, I use dowels to put on the head. I use uh, glue and clamps and screws to screw it on. Uh, I will always fill the screw holes with just uh, epoxy sculpt, and I've had never had any trouble with that. It's held up really well. So, and I like to just pull them real tight together when they're when I put them together. As you can, see, this is uh, one of my ones I haven't painted of the eleven, and as you can see, they're getting more and more simple. This one doesn't even have the bill carved on. I'm going to see how that goes. Just painting the painting the bill in. I like to try new stuff. Just little teeny tweaks at a time. Okay, one so thing that... So after you did the buffalo heads, <coughs> they just start getting more of a favorite duck besides that? Well... From Minnesota hunting anyway? Yeah, where I hunt, uh, we see very few puddle ducks. It's mostly redheads and canvasbacks and ringnecks and things like that. So that's kind of what I've gravitated towards. I do have a pair of gadwalls, a pair of widgeon, and a pair of teal that are unpainted. But <laughs> of course, I have to paint the redheads first because divers are always priority. Okay. And one thing I do is I, I, uh, I don't use any power at all. It's all just hand tools. Uh, <coughs> Just basically your normal carpenter tools, you know, the big carpenter hand saws and uh, regular planes for squaring up the blocks, hand planes, um, regular carving gouges and chisels, uh, no, no power at all. You know, if I want to do holes, I've got, I can either use the, either the brace or the, the egg beater drill, so just kind of just old fashioned stuff. Um, now there's a couple of tools that I really like, so I brought them in. Uh, this is an old fashioned, well, it could be very old fashioned, who knows? But I really like these Japanese saws. Uh, this one, you can get them even much more fine than this, the teeth. But this one happens to be a cross cut here, very fine teeth, and then it's a rip saw on this side. And the reason that these are so great is because they are very thin and they cut on the pull stroke. That's why they can be so thin. You're not, you're not cutting on the push stroke. And they're just very sharp. Uh, I've just gone through a couple blades in 15 years, so I don't know if you can get them sharpened anywhere. I just buy a new blade, so. And another thing that I think is really great are, I use rasps quite a bit. And rasps vary a lot in their quality. These rasps are Nicholson uh, pattern makers rasps, and there's a number 49 and number 50 here. 50's a little finer. I'll just pass that around. And they just cut beautifully. Uh, most rasps are just, I think, are really difficult to work with, but those are really sharp. What number are those? 31? It's a 49 and a 50. You ever use a 30? My neighbor would give me a 37 or 39. I never use that. I have, I, well, maybe I have. I just haven't paid attention. I do have some coarse. I have some real coarse rasps that, that I, I don't use them very much. 
Uh, of course, you put a handle on it before you use them. But, um, they're just really, really nice. Uh, one thing that I could get along without, but I think it's kind of fun once in a while, is a little router plane. This is, I use this for when I'm hollowing out the, the bottom board. You know, I think, Tom, Tom you probably have a, like a force or drill bits or something, and you can just put your press and it just, you know, drills it out nice and smooth on the bottom. Well, I usually gouge mine out, and then that, you know, half inch edge around, you can just run this plane on top of it, and the, the blade goes down. And so I usually gouge it out roughly, and then, Instead of having to you know, measure the thickness all the time, you can just you know just take that after, after gouging gaug out roughly. You can just use this plane and pull it out, which is kind of nice. But you know that's kind of a small part of making the decoys, but it is kind of handy. So, and I like tools. So, so now you don't use a bandsaw to cut your basic right. body shape out. It's no. all of that uh, other saw. No, that's, I have a lot of trouble doing the basic body shape because I don't have that, I don't have a good eye, I just can't hack it out, you know. So I have to go through a whole bunch of gyrations to, to have it come out kind of like when you bandsaw it. In fact, I was just going to mention that. Um, since I don't use power, the alternative to a bandsaw would be something like this, a bow saw. We got a couple of these kind of the thickness of a bandsaw blade, so you can go around corners and everything. But I've never been able to get the hang of it, so I've I told myself I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to do this, but I haven't yet, so I think that's my next step, is learn how to, learn how to use this saw. Because my process is really cumbersome. What I do is imagine this is your, the top view of your decoy block, Instead of being that thick, it's really that thick. Okay. So what I'll do is I will sort of take mark some points that I think are important on this outline. This is our top view. So I say, well, that point's really important. So I will make a mark all the way around, top to bottom. Remember, this is three, three and a half inches thick. And then I'll take my saw and I will cut down to that mark. So that mark is identifiable no matter what you do after that. You can always find that mark. And depending upon how complicated the shape is, I'll maybe go down to here, go down to here, go down to here, here, here. Like that with a saw curve, with just a saw curve and it ends right at the edge of the pattern. Um, do that with the top view, do that with the side view. And then uh, when you've done that all the way around, that's after you, I have uh, temporarily fasten the bottom board to the top board so you're, you're shaping them both at once. So after I've got these soft, soft curves marking those spots, then I can just take my big old carpenter saw and saw this whole piece off, saw that piece off, saw the, saw the back off, just hack off as much wood as quickly as you can. And then after that, you could use the wood carving chisels to gouge this out and maybe a rasp too to get to the more more finely follow that shape so it's kind of kind of a uh, process uh, it's a lot of saw cuts I'll do it on two di two dimensions on the body and I do it on three dimensions on the head uh, so that's what I've been doing if you have a really small decoy instead of making all these saw cuts you could just use it uh, drill a hole so the hole will mark that spot and you can just hack that off and just carve down the holes. So, so it would be really helpful if I learned how to use a bow saw. <laughs> but it gets the job done uh, because, like I say, I have a very hard time just hacking it out. I couldn't take a ch I couldn't take a, ha a hatchet and make a decoy. I just uh, I just don't have the, the skill to do that. So that's one thing I really have to do different. Uh, one thing I do differently. The other thing is. Uh, I wouldn't have to do it this way, but I do, is I put the keel on permanently really early in the process, okay? What? I attach the, the keel to the, to the bottom board early in the process, and I use it a lot for, you know, put it in my work make vice and crank it in, and it's nice and solid, I can, you know, pound away on it with my mallets and chisels and stuff. Um, 
So when I go to weight it, what I do is I just take a brace with an auger bit and I'll drill. Well, first I'll figure out where the balance point is on this decoy. You know, just put a pencil under it or something, kind of balance it. Find the middle point on this keel, start there. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm cu just cutting a groove in here to drop weight into. So all I'll do is I'll, this groove happen to go from here to here. I'll use a brace and an auger drill and just drill down here, 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 here. Take a chisel and make a nice little mortise there, sharp, uh, nice straight edges. And then what I'll do, this is, it'll be all, by then it's all ready to float it in the, float it in the sink. It's all rough carved out so I can float it in the sink and put my weight where I want it. So what I'll take is just regular weights that you'd buy for putting around a decoy, decoy weights. They're usually about that long. This one's a little short. I'll just take pieces of that, drop two of them side by side in that slot, and then I can put it in the sink, and if it's too much that way, just slide my two pieces back a little farther or forward just so I can, get, I can find it that way. Then when I find the spot, I might just put a little brand in there so they, so they won't move anymore. And then I just make a little little board to fill that up. How many ounces of weight do you put in your keel? Oh, uh, not enough. We'll be getting to that shortly. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how much it is. I would say minimum of like five ounces, something like that. I do it to a more. I would a say more style more. canvas bag in Louisville, and I want to put in six ounces of that. I would. I would definitely. Be I definitely go. I would. Mine. Most of my. Most of my, mine. I've made with too little weight. So anyhow, that little that little board that goes in there. You just cut it out with a saw. You uh, uh, cut it the length. I cut it a little bit big. And then all I do is hold. I just hold my my plane, my carpenter's plane, a smoothing plane or jack plane or something like that, and just hold that little board. And it's like a little planer. So you're moving the board instead of the plane. And you can just trim it down so it fits perfectly, and you add a little glue, pound it in, you're all set. You put some glue in there, not? Uh, just to yeah. hold the hold the piece of wood in. Just wedge it in. Yep. So. You're cheap. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I don't have much to say about painting. Uh, I'm not very good at it, and I'm, which is great that I'm not into detail very much. You can see these, uh, a lot of my, the look that I've got is not through painting feathers, it's just through streaks and blobs and all that, but at a distance, it gives the effect of the feathers, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm not too concerned of the up close. This is another one that's just like this, it's not, there's no feathers there, it's just streaking. And this one, if you put a little hand buffle at a real one right next to it, looks just right. Uh, one mistake I usually make is when I paint, I've been putting on a, a primer coat, and usually I put it on, I don't match up the following coat very well. I've usually gone too light. So you can see the wear and tear on these decoys. There's a light primer coming through where the paint is starting to wear off. You can see it on the tops of the heads and on the on the tails. So that's something I have to be more careful on. The hardest thing for me in painting is just to get the right, the right general tone. So I think I just have to keep working on it lo longer until I get the right tone and then plow ahead. Usually I get impatient and I don't get quite the right color. Like this one, I think this is not a very good coloration for a hand can. Uh, this one I think is good. I like the I like the back on this ring bill. This brown's a little too maybe a little too bright. Uh, canvas back looks good. I'm pretty good with white and black. I can do that. <laughs> I have a question for you. Sure. How did you cut that big swan out? Oh, they're both done the same way. Um, if you look at this, you can see there's lots of laminations here. 
So I had gone up north and bought some cedar boards, they're inch and an eighth inch boards from a guy up in the Wabek or someplace. And then uh, I had looked at tons of swan pictures and did some average measurements and put together the pattern, made a pattern for it. And then I gauged where each one of my donuts would, which each one of my layers would be and cut them out. And then what I did before I put them together, I cut out the, turned them into just rings. I cut out the middle. So when I laminated together, I was just laminating donuts together. So I'm sure I got at least one duck decoy out of my scraps, my donut scraps. <laughs> so each layer, that's one board. No, this is many boards. No, 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 that one, the bottom one. Bottom one is one board, yeah. Yeah, but how wide was that? That's on my cedar board. Oh, it could have been, it could have been, I don't know. That's a, that's a it could have been uh, a couple of boards, I'm not sure. I may have, I probably glued some together. I, I'm a, it's, I, it would be unusual for me to have one that big. It's hard to find white cedar yeah. that wide. And then the, the head again is laminations, and the neck is a little laminated too, so, yeah. And this one, you can see the paint kind of faded. I think this might have actually been alkyd oils on this paint. I mean, on this on this one, you know, like artist oils. Uh, but the color, the, the must have been the chemicals in the wood have sort of come through. And I kind of like the look. It's looking like a younger swan all the time instead of a old white one. <laughs> and this one, I think, might have been house paint. And that one has stayed. Uh, very white. If you use house paint on that one, would that have been a satin color? I don't know, it's been a while. Yeah. Not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. So, what's important to me is that the decoys are really durable. As I was mentioning, this one's probably been in and out of the water like seven. 75 times and they've just held up really well. I've never had any trouble with the, the construction of them. Uh, the paint is just normal wear and tear. Never had the paint really fail. Uh, I don't treat them real gently. I do keep them in, I carry them around in those sacks with the, the slots in them, the slot for each decoy. So I do do that, but they do end up rolling around on the bottom of the boat once in a while. And I don't hesitate to you know, throw them out if I have to. So. Uh, I don't throw them into the boat. <laughs> I draw a limit. Uh, I mentioned I haven't touched up the paint at all. Uh, the only, one exception I had is I did a poor job of aligning the grain properly to go straight down the bills. And I had my dozen decoy sack filled with decoys, all with their bills up, set it on top of a pile of sacks of plastic decoys in a shed with a concrete floor, mm -hmm. came back in the morning and had done a 180 and I had like five bills to repair. And the ones that needed repair were ones that with the grain went like this way or that way or something. But if the grain was straight down the bill, they didn't break. So, so now I'm real careful to make sure when I lay out that head block that the grain goes straight down the bill. On your swan bill, did you uh, put anything further in the neck for reinforcing? Even though it's, a, it's all kind of going to stack, did you put a dowel down the nope. side or anything? Nope, there's nothing, no dowel. This is just, I'm trying to look at the laminations, and I'm not sure which way they go, but there, it's it's a big heavy dowel in here, maybe three quarters of inch dowel in here, and same up here, but that's it. <coughs> and the, the neck isn't hollow, just the body. Is it real? Kind of glue do you like to use? I've always used that gorilla, gorilla glue and it's worked out really well. Oh. Yeah. I know some people like the uh, Type Bond 3, I think, but I've always used the Gorilla glue. Is it the neck is hollow? It's not hollow. It's not. I know some people would, would have hollowed the neck, but I didn't. Uh, so they've been real dur durable. Uh, what's really important to me is how seaworthy they are. Now, all of these, when I originally made them, would self-write. But that doesn't really tell the whole story. Uh, now, this buffalo, this one always has floated really, really well. Uh, no problems at all. 
I made a, a number of ring bills like this, and I figured I was at this phase where I was thinking if I raise the height of the decoy a little bit, the, the height of the body, that they'd be more, more visible. But it did make it pretty hot, top, top heavy. So even though they self write, like this one was driving me nuts a couple of weeks ago because we had a really strong northwest wind and big waves. God got it, it was rolling over. It was rolling over. I can't stand that. So so it's uh, I did open this one up just to to because I I'm gonna put heavier weight in here, so just pass that around. It shows how I just cram that those those pieces of decoy weight side by side into that group. Uh, again, I was trying for to get a higher decoy to make it more visible. Uh, these would wouldn't roll, uh, so which is good, but they could catch so much wind that they would be. It would look like America's Cup, you know, it was just riding along, you know, high side. And so these, I I had like three of these canvas backs. I cut the keel off. This is a much deeper keel now, and a lot more weight, so now they they ride really well. But it's kind of Try and true. Uh, this one works good. This one works good. This is the most absolutely most terrible decoy for riding waves in, in the wind. It's just horrible. Uh, I made, I was making two swans. The bodies were very, very similar. Uh, I finished this one up and put it out in the fall and had some high winds. And this decoy, even though it self writes and everything, it goes like this. You know, it just rocks in the waves, and it's, the head almost touches the water. It drives me nuts. Uh, so, like I say, the other one I had here was about the same design body, but I couldn't, uh, couldn't have that. So I took this body, and I lopped off both sides and built it out. You can see it looks a little bit, got a little bit of a pot belly, but made a lot wider. Uh, I lopped off the top. And made it a lot, a lot flatter. Uh, this was going to be a curved, uh, curved neck swan to start out with, but I, I brought it down a little lower. And this swan rides beautifully, just absolutely beautifully. So it's just a matter of bringing the center of, of gravity down and widening it out, basically. And, and there's more, a little more weight in the keel. So. Live and learn. You think the wind is catching that big tall head? That's definitely it. The wind catches it. I can have it in the you know on the lee shore, 30 feet from the shoreline, on the calm shore, and it, it'll be you know rocking like that because it just catches so much wind. But you see pictures of swan decoys where they've got these great big, huge keels on them, and now I know why because they just they're up there in the wind. They need those keels. Have you tried? Have you considered putting a, one of those types of old-time keels on it, like a Madison? No, the, style? I, I haven't because if I was just going to display it, I would. But these are awkward enough to haul in and out of the water and in the boat and yeah. crank the lines on and everything, just the way they are. If I had another another foot of keel, I would just go nuts trying to. to uh, I like but do you, do you think that would? That I would think it would work. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, think it would work. I think it would too. Yeah, I think it would work. Okay. Uh, the only other practical thing was wrapping the cords. I like to have a little extra groove on the keel. So when you're wrapping your strings, I like the figure eight technique. So when you're wrapping the strings, if you don't do it exactly right, instead of catching here, maybe it'll catch here. There's nothing worse than getting up in the morning in the dark and putting out decoys and have strings that have slipped off the decoys. So I just do that little extra there. I usually put a hole in the front of the back in case I want to change where I have my cord. I've, I've found that uh, I have a number of really low head decoys, and this one has no neck at all. The low head decoys, I can't really wrap a weight around them, but I can wrap the string around them, but there's no place to fasten the weight. And I like regular strap weights like this. And this one, there's no neck at all, so you can't even wrap the string around it. So what I did is I designed a, just designed a keel where it's kind of got a little neck down here, so it's just just a little added odd shaped keel that I can just wrap the cord around the keel and then just wrap the weight around this little extra little neck. So 
That's one way to get around that. And I do that on my low head ones too because I could just wrap them around that really low head and then just put the weight down here. So the only other thing I wanted to mention was uh, sometimes you can design a decoy so it's really good, really easy to hold in your hand. Like this decoy is okay, but just a couple of weeks ago, my hands were cold. I thought I'd get really, when I built this one, I thought I'd make it more attractive. This keel kind of has a nice little taper to it. I think it looks great, you know, really pretty. But when you hold it, that taper, uh, if you got decoy gloves on and your hands are cold, it's really hard to hold on to. Because if you look, so my other keels before that were just straight, straight like this, which is okay, holds pretty good. Then I got fancy, it's harder to hold on to. And I figure if that's harder to hold on to, why don't we just go the other way and bevel it, but bevel it the other direction. So this one, your fingers just grab right on it. It's like you can't, you can't slip off. And that kind of matters when, it, when you're cold and the ice, they're iced up or frosted up. And so that's about all I have. Uh, as I mentioned, my experience with decoys has been mostly with diving ducks, which aren't known to be the wiliest of species. So I'm not sure if I have more birds come in with these than I did with the jug coys. In fact, I don't think I did. But again, it could have been the 240, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, I do know that when the birds land the decoys, you just like to watch your ducks puttering around. They really like, you know, I've had swans sit by these for just park, go to sleep for two hours. You know, they, just, they were just really at ease with these hand-carved decoys. Um, but, you know, even if the ducks aren't around, if you have your nice set of hand-carved decoys. They, they just look so good out there. <laughs> you know, who needs ducks, you know? Who needs ducks? So that's all I have. That's it. Well, do, you, do, you, do you rig three or four, say canvas bags, do you rig three or four together? No, I've always singly yeah. weighted every one of them, yeah. I, I, I think it's really effective to, you know, and time-saving time to rig them that way or in lines, but I've never done that. And I, I just, yeah, I really like putting these out. This fall, I had, didn't have, I haven't seen a tundra swan all fall, so I kind of missed the, missed the flight this year, and I'm kind of done for the season, so. But that's it, any other questions? Great.